We're at Puma Punku, which is on the Altiplano in Bolivia. Elevation about 13,000 feet above sea level. And Puma Punku, the name itself, means the gate of the Puma. Now, the name itself is uh, Quechua, the language of the Inca. So the Inca likely named this place Puma Punku when they were here in the 15th century AD. Prior to the Inca, and actually living here to this very day, are the Aymara people. And they arrived here and kicked out the Tiwanaku people around 1000 AD. So conventional archaeologists believe that Pumapunku and Tiwanaku were both creations of the Tiwanaku culture, who arrived here at about 100 AD. However, I'll show you evidence that in fact the Tiwanaku people found Tiwanaku and Pumapunku in ruins, that these places are much, much older than being 2,000 years old and were created using lost ancient high technology. The stonework you're looking at is quite refined. You can see that there's no mortar in any of the joints. The stones fit perfectly together, even after thousands of years of wear. Now this stone that you're looking at is red sandstone. It's not local. There is no local stone here at Pumapunku. In fact, the stone comes from a quarry nine miles in that direction over those mountains. So that is quite an incredible feat that the stone was cut and moved to this location from nine miles away. The Tiwanaku people were at best a Bronze Age culture. So they did not have the capability of being able to cut and finally shape and fit these stones together using simple bronze tools. That's one factor that shows us that the site must be older than them because the Aymara people who came later barely had Bronze Age tools. And then what is curious is this stone here, or actually this layer of stone. This is not the red sandstone. It in fact comes from much farther away. The gray stone, which has not been properly identified yet, some people call it diorite, some people call it andesite, but it doesn't seem to be either of those. Um, it's from a completely different quarry located 70 kilometers away. And in this area here, in this construction, it's only one level. It's number, it's the fifth level. And the stone interlocks in with the other levels, which are made of the red sandstone. So what you can see here is that there are the gray stone blocks sticking out of the side of the wall, which is intriguing. The area where I'm walking was only excavated between five and ten years ago. Prior to that, this whole area, all of the stonework was buried underground. So the question is, what happened here? There's convincing scientific data that this site was impacted by a giant wall of mud. And the question is when? Clearly, it happened before the time of the Inca, 
before the time of the Aymara, and before the time of the Tiwanaku. Scientific evidence suggests that this event happened 12,000 years ago. And I know many of you won't accept that because you think the oldest civilization that we know of could be the Sumerians dating back about 6,000 years. But there is convincing evidence that our planet was impacted by a massive cataclysm about 12,000 years ago. So any civilization existing at that time would have been destroyed, such as here at Pumapunku. So here again is where the layer of the gray stone is. It's quite magnetic. It contains magnetite. And so it reacts to a Tesla meter. And as you can see, that the stone actually, this is one piece of stone that was cut specially for this layer to interlock into. Way off in the distance there is Serocapia. And that is the source of the gray stone. It was brought all the way from there to here. So the point being, if you were simply building a temple or some other quasi-pragmatic construction, why would you bother to bring stone from 70 kilometers away when there's abundant stone nine miles away? And why is that gray stone only in one layer and not in another layer. What I'm suggesting to you is that the gray stone was very important for one reason, and that is its magnetic quality. If there was one layer of the gray stone that went all the way around this big structure, it would mean, quite possibly, that that would be a band of energy. And so the magnetic energy inside the temple structure would be different than the outside area. What that would have been used for specifically, I can't tell you. And that's why I continue to research this place. I've been here at least 40 times, and in the last four times is when we started to bring equipment that measures magnetics to see what anomalies are present here. This is Tiwanaku culture construction or reconstruction and compare it with the original construction which is far superior. So here we have a Tesla meter and the ambient measurement in micro Teslas is about 24 micro Teslas. As we approach the stone especially the gray stone, it's increasing up to 40, down to 34, 31, and back to ambient again. So we are measuring a difference between the ambient uh, reading in micro Teslas and uh, the gray stone. The gray stone has a higher reading, but this is not really profound in this area. When we visit other locations, especially where the famous H blocks are, we'll see a massive escalation in what the Tesla meter is reading. Now this staircase you can see, which is made up of uh, red sandstone, has an incredible amount of weathering. And so, is it possible that this weathering is thousands upon thousands of years old? Lake Titicaca stands behind me. It's about seven miles uh, from the back of my head. But 12,000 years ago, the lake level was where I'm standing right now, right at the base of this staircase. So it is possible that 12,000 years ago, Pumapunku met Lake Titicaca, and you could literally sail from here north by more than a hundred miles. And now we're going to head to the main 
part that has been excavated, and this is where we find the famous H blocks. There are eight, and no one knows originally how many there would have been. So these are the famous H-blocks, and they display very interesting magnetic anomalies. So here we have a baseline reading of about 24 microteslas. And as we approach the H-blocks, it goes up. dramatically as we go along, dropping down to 19, up to 56, putting it inside, goes down to 9, back out, goes up to 32, so we're seeing a lot of variation in the magnetic field and what it appears is that the shape of the H blocks themselves are dictating the magnetic field. So it's not simply that there is a deposit of magnetite in the stone itself, but the magnetism and the shape seem to go hand in hand, which is very intriguing. So clearly we're looking at something very sophisticated going on here. This is not the work of a Bronze Age culture that, were that uh, was simply building a temple of some kind. We're looking at a much older civilization that not only had lost ancient high technology to be able to achieve cutting the stone and actually cutting it from the quarry, moving it, setting it into place, and cutting the fine detail, but also the magnetic anomalies are clearly part of the design. But what was it that they had achieved in order to do that. And two more of the H blocks. The interesting thing here is that these are dovetail shapes. The size here is narrower than in the back. So they weren't simply making 90 degree angles, they were making far more complex angles than that. And one of the most intriguing stones that's here has a channel in it and holes drilled very evenly. And it, as well, has some incredible magnetic anomalies. And here the magnetometer is going absolutely crazy. It's measuring over 408 in this particular location. 
And here, in fact, the magnetometer has gone off the charts. The screen has turned red, meaning that it's measuring things higher than it possibly can. All of these stones are in situ, meaning that this is where they were found. So, obviously, some kind of cataclysm event happened here to cause this. It's likely that there's far more as well buried under our feet. The red sandstone does not um, show any reading with the magnetometer when, when we take it up to it, but the gray stone in almost all cases does. So again, I believe that they chose it on purpose for its magnetic properties and were likely trying to set up magnetic fields of some kind um, on the inside of this so-called temple. 1370 micro teslas in this little enclosure here. And now the machine is actually, or the app has stopped working. So the Tesla meter is now frozen at 1,370 microteslas. And I guess I'll have to turn it off and turn it on to see what's going on with that. Again, we're measuring incredible magnetic anomalies at this site of Pumapunku on the Altiplano of Bolivia. So we found evidence that there were at least 10 H blocks. And what you have to realize is that they are all slightly different in shape and size. <clears throat> so they were not cranked out in a factory. They were not poured into a mold. They were individually handcrafted and each slightly different. But the question is why? And it's not error because the precision of the flat surfaces here are astonishing. Sometimes we find a virgin surface which is one where the stone has either been buried or has been lying down for an extended period of time protected from the weather and measurements have been made that the flatness of the surface is within a few ten thousandths of being laser perfect. So you're not looking at the workmanship of a Bronze Age culture called the Tiwanaku here Again, you're talking about the fact that the Tiwanaku culture discovered Pumapunku and Tiwanaku in ruins, buried by a massive mud wave that came from Lake Titicaca in behind. And that seems to be the story of this place. Never ending fascination for me. Now the theory behind the cataclysmic event is that Mount Kapia, which is 70 kilometers in that direction, may have erupted as the result of this massive cataclysm global of 12,000 years ago. It triggered itself back on, exploded possibly, debris fell into Lake Titicaca, created a mini tsunami. That tsunami spread from the north to the south and buried not only Pumapunku, but also the Akapana Pyramid of Tiwanaku that's off in this direction. Now again, Tiwanaku and Pumapunku are the same place. It's just that when the Tiwanaku civilization arrived here 2,000 years ago, they found more above ground stone at Tiwanaku. So that's where they set up their ceremonial city. Whereas it's likely that all of Pumapunku was buried underground, except maybe for a few stones projecting out of the ground. We've had many, many engineers accompany us here, as well as stonemasons, etc. None of them will accept the idea for one second that the Bronze Age Tiwanaku culture were responsible for this work. Uh, some of them even suggest that some of this work would be very difficult to achieve now in the 21st century. So we have no choice 
but to accept the idea that whoever was here had astonishing capabilities of cutting stone from a distant quarries, shaping them, bringing them here, and utilizing this site for an as yet unknown or as yet f not fully known purpose. But now we know that magnetism was definitely a component of what they were working with. And if it takes me 50 more times to come back to Puma Punku, I will do so in order to try to figure out who built this and when. My guess again is more than 12,000 years ago because the cataclysm that swept the planet happened 11,700 to 11,900 years ago. Uh, damaged famous places we know of, such as Egypt, many of the megalithic sites in Egypt, including the Great Pyramid Complex at Giza, are pre-dynastic Egyptian. Uh, the Egyptians arrived in that area 5,000 years ago, just like the Tiwanaku culture arrived here 2,000 years ago and found the remains of great builders. They were so astonished that, of course, they adopted the sites, uh, venerated whoever it was that came first, but modern-day academics are pretty well stuck in their conviction, and that is that there was no civilization prior to 6,000 years ago, that we started out as very primitive people living in small little groups. Gradually over time, villages formed, farming began, and around 6,000 years ago, you have civilizations rising in the Indus Valley, um, also Sumeria, etc., However, that was likely a renaissance of culture. The cataclysm struck about 12,000 years ago. All of the civilizations were destroyed or people were forced to scatter, and it took several thousand years ago for the redevelopment of civilization.